Early on, when we first started this course, we established a principle. Whenever we are going to talk about complicated situations, we are going to look at the simplest example of that in nature first. And by, by no means, signaling is an easy subject. So let's talk about the easiest system of signaling that we can study. Let's look at an example of E. coli. E. coli is a bacteria that lives in our intestine. This bacteria, of course, is subjected to very different environments. As we saw in our, one of our previous modules, how the lactose, lactose operon works. Sometimes the solute or the, if a person eats something which the bacteria does not have enzymes to degrade right away, it makes those enzymes. Also, very importantly, people sometimes they are fasting. The concentration of solutes in the body or intestinal tract is very low. And then they suddenly have a nice juicy meal and suddenly the concentration of solutes or the food particles increases dramatically. So this, how does this bacteria cope with this problem? Let's look at that. E. coli has two membranes an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And it has a cell wall also. The outer membrane of this bacteria is pretty much permeable because it has these holes you can see and most molecules can get through this, these pores. The inner membrane on the other hand is selectively permeable. Not everything can get through because it does not have these pores or these holes. So the space between these two uh, membranes is called the intermembrane space. Once if the bacteria is in environment where there is low solute concentration or food particles are very little, a person has been fasting, for example, the concentration of solute molecules is low in the intramembrane space. But suddenly if a person eats a heavy juicy meal, the concentration of solute molecules will suddenly increase in the environment of the, this bacteria and these solute molecules will also enter intramembranous space. Now, as we know, in this situation where there is hypertonic solution outside the cell, the water will move outside. So this bacteria will start losing water very rapidly if situation is not handled. So let's see what happens. Once the solute concentration increases in the intramembranous space, there is a receptor present in the inner membrane of this bacteria. This receptor is called NZ. I'll point it out here, right here. This NZ, when it, a solute molecule attaches to NZ, the NZ goes through a conformational change. This conformational change affects the cytoplasmic domain of this receptor also. And once that happens, a new domain, for example, when this atoms within this molecule rearrange, a region of this molecule, which has a kinase activity, an enzymatic activity that can attach a phosphate group to this enzyme, to this receptor, appears or is, is unfolded, is now available, and it does what it is supposed to do. It uses an ATP and puts the, one of the phosphate groups from ATP to the cytoplasmic domain of this receptor. Once this happens, another protein present in the plasma membrane called OMPR, which could previously not engage the NZ, inactive NZ, now when it senses the NZ has been activated, it binds this NZ and in turn NZ phosphorylates this protein, our protein OMPR. OMPR, once it is phosphorylated, it itself has a conformational change. Now certain regions of this protein are exposed that which were hidden previously. These regions of this protein can bind specific regions of DNA on the chromosome of this bacteria. When that happens, this protein, OMPR, acts as a transcription factor, recruits RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase will form messenger RNA. 
which will be translated into a protein and in this case we call the protein omp c omp c will be exported in the intramembranous space and it finds these pores and plugs them so no new solute molecules can enter the intramembranous space changing the osmolarity of fluid there so couple of things i would like to again clarify the activity of this enzyme nz putting a phosphate group on itself is called autophosphorylation nz when once it becomes active it phosphorylates omp r so omp r is basically responding to the change in nz structure therefore it is called a responder in this scenario so also we talked about this that signals have to be amplified so here one nz can activate one omp r which will result in production of one or two messenger rnas and which will result in production of several hundred omp c proteins so the first thing ligand receptor interaction conformational change these are the lessons we have learned from this example activity of the receptor is changed which results in autophosphorylation which results in phosphorylation of the responder omp r in our case signal is amplified transcription factor is activated which is omp r our responder and protein synthesis results in altered cell activity so this bacteria has developed a mechanism preventing water loss once the external environment changes so this bacteria produces a protein which alters its activity pre prevents water from leaving the cell and entering the extracellular space even such a primitive small animal a small cell living entity has developed this mechanism we will take this example we will what the, the lessons we have learned from this example and we'll expand on them when we look at more complicated systems